a member of um, many, many organizations uh, that deal with the Holocaust. He is also the author of, if I count it well, 11 books and uh, over 100 articles and chapters in a variety of books. Um, his new book will come out, um, and I think that here is the title on the other hand, I don't see the title of the new book, and I don't have my press here, so would you be so kind to, if I start it out with your new book that is not yet out, um, what is the title? Afterwards. Uh, afterwards. Uh, after, after hyphen words. Um, Post-Holocaust Dialogues on Forgiveness, Reconciliation, and Justice. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Sorry for having forgotten that and I didn't see it here immediately. Um, without telling you much more, uh, we would like to ask Professor Peterson to come and to talk to us today. Thank you, Juji, and uh, I want to express my thanks and appreciation to Dr. Einspruch for uh, supporting this series. Um, this afternoon I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the assault, what I call the assault on the holy in the, holy in the Holocaust. Um, and I just want to begin, I guess, by considering the word Holocaust itself. Um, the word Holocaust is not a synonym for horrific suffering and mass murder and uh, beating and burning and starving people to death. Um, the Holocaust, as you know, is also known as Shoah, as uh, Hurban. Hurban is a, uh, a term used in Yiddish text. It's actually a Hebrew word. It's a word used to, to refer to the destruction of the holy temple. Um, therefore, Hurban uh, expresses a, uh, a catastrophe that has metaphysical dimensions, that is to say, dimensions involving something uh, concerning God's presence in the world. Um, the word Shoah uh, has the same root with the, uh, the Shin, Vav, and Ein, or Aleph, Shin, Vav, Aleph, uh, the same three letter root as uh, words for nothingness and lie. Um, in terms of Shoah, the Holocaust is a radical imposition of a radical nothingness upon the world. Um, therefore, it's, the Holocaust suggests much more than brutality, although it includes that, uh, oppression, although it includes that, murder, although it includes that. The Holocaust, if I can you know, state it simply, um, ent entails the struggle over a question, the question of what is a human being or what gives a human being value. It's a, it's a question that uh, Holocaust survivors, some survivors also address, and the most famous ones, Elie Wiesel, for example, uh, has his famous statement in Legends of Our Time that uh, at Auschwitz, not only human, were human beings murdered, but the very notion of a human being was murdered. Uh, not only were husbands, mothers, fathers, children murdered, but the very concept of a child, of a mother, of a father was subject to annihilation. Uh, Primo Levi's book, his famous work, uh, Survival in Auschwitz, uh, which is a translation of Se Questo en Omo, which uh, is the question, is this a man? What is a man? What is a human being? Um, even Survival in Auschwitz, as those of you who are uh, students of Dr. Oshvat are aware, is subtitled, An Assault on, The Nazi Assault on Humanity. Humanity meaning not all of humanity in the world merely, but the notion of humanity. What constitutes humanity? Um, therefore, one of the key issues, one of the key elements at work here entails this, this assault on the very notion of a human being. If you want to consider what the assault on the holy is or what that's like, look to the assault on the human. Um, and what is a human being? What gives a human being value? In the context of, of Nazi 
ideology and the Nazi, uh, to use the German word, the, the Weltanschauung, which is a, a view of all of reality. It's not just a political movement, you understand. Um, a human being has value as a result of, uh, first of all, a natural accident, an accident of nature, being born an Aryan, gives, gives you value. And within the context of being born an Aryan, one takes on value through a, a will to power, through re a resolve to overcome such uh, things, such Jewish inventions as conscience. Conscience, you see, is a Jewish invention used to subjugate us to you know, moral issues when through a, a will to power we should rise above that. And indeed, the most famous Nazi propaganda film of Lenny Riefenstahl is Triumph of the Will. It's not triumph of the truth, triumph of the good, triumph of the holy, it's triumph of the will. That's what justifies us. And finally, from a Nazi point of view, an Aryan is radically distinct from, separate from any other category, certainly from a Jew. An Aryan has nothing more in common with a Jew than, uh, than you have in common with a cockroach. Um, along this line, uh, we have to keep in mind that the Nazi notion of race here, that if I am part of the Aryan race and I mean something, is not like the notion of race that, that most of us have and the way that we think about race. First of all, we think about race largely in terms of, of color uh, or, or uh, physiognomy or, or you know, genetic features, physical features. Um, for the most part, we, we don't equate race with soul. Um, for the most part, even the racists among us are happy to, as long as we're segregated, uh, don't mind if the people of the other, of the races of color attend their church and do, it, and do their thing, as long as we don't have to be around them, as long as we don't have to drink from the same drinking fountain, you see. Um, according to Alfred Rosenberg, the, the Nazi philosopher, race and soul, race and character, race and essence are one and the same thing. Uh, as Rosenberg said, the Talmud didn't make the Jew, the Jew made the Talmud. So when you say, well, uh, the Nazis wanted to murder every Jew, religious or non-religious, both, which is absolutely true, um, they wanted to murder non-religious Jews because they were inclined to think Talmudically. And that can't be changed. They can't, they can't be redeemed, they can't be re-educated. Um, they don't, therefore, they can't, therefore, fall within the, the, the context of humanity as Nazis were understanding humanity. Indeed, in 1935, the National Socialist Attorneys Guild uh, recommended that the word mensch, human being, be removed from the legal code because it was creating confusion. Uh, in sep the, the Nuremberg Laws of September 1935, as you know, uh, were laws that defined, ex codified exactly what a Jew is. Um, anyone with one Jewish grandparent could, could uh, find himself or herself on a train for Auschwitz. Of course, there were various categories of mixed bloods and so on. But what made, what made the grandparent Jewish? The, the grandparent was Jewish if the grandparent belonged to a, a religious congregation of Jews. And of course, under the Nuremberg Laws, anyone who converted to Judaism was also a Jew and subject to extermination. Um, so you have, you have some of the, you know, the Nazi thinking about humanity, human being, what gives a human being value, what makes a human life matter. Uh, radically and diametrically opposed to this thinking about a human being is a Judaic view or the Talmudic view of what makes a human life matter. It's certainly it's absolutely incompatible with the Nazi view. Um, first of all, from, a, from the standpoint of, uh, of, a, the, of a Jewish religious tradition, 
human beings don't come into the world by accident or as a result of an accident of nature. Human beings are created um, by a, you know, a transcendent creator in whose image that human being is created, as we all know from, you know, reading the first two chapters of the book of Genesis. Um, a hum every human being has, in other words, every human being has an inherent value, uh, regardless of, you know, color, regardless of gender, regardless of talent, regardless of intelligence, regardless even of moral character. Regardless of moral character. Even the one you have every reason to despise is one who summons your care from the, from the standpoint of this tradition because that one has an infinite value determined by a transcendent uh, creator. Um, first of all, secondly, according to the tale of the creation of humanity, all of humanity begins with one human being and not two. And the rabbis ask, well, why, why one and not two? I mean, doesn't it take two? <laughs> How can you just have, begin with one? The, uh, the explanation given in uh, a Talmudic text known as the Tosefta is that uh, God created one so that no one can say to his neighbor, my dad is better than your dad or that must come from your side of the family because it could never come from my side of the family. There's only one side of the family. And we are all literally <coughs> blood. We all have a physical connection to each other and we all have a, a metaphysical or spiritual connection to each other. And that connection is defined by an accountability, a responsibility to and for one another. Um, the, the Talmud says that, that uh, in the Pirkei Avot, one of the tractates of the Talmud, that he is wise who can learn from anyone. From anyone. That means I can learn from, from uh, an infant or I can learn from uh, an Alzheimer's patient I, and not just from my smarter than average colleagues with whom I hardly ever agree. I can still learn. What can I learn? If, if, that's, if I can learn from anyone, I learn something about what is sacred, what there is to love, uh, what's entrusted to my care, uh, what my responsibility is. And of course, this idea of a fundamental connection and an absolute value to every human being is antithetical to Nazi thinking. Uh, in the uh, famous scripture of Le uh, Leviticus 19.18, Vahavta echa komocha, and you should love your neighbor as yourself, the scripture does not mean I know how much you love yourself and that's how much I want you to love your neighbor. Uh, at least not according to one interpretation. It means Vahavta echa, love your neighbor, you know, period or colon, of that is what you are. You are made of the love for your neighbor. You are made of the relation to your fellow human being, widow, orphan, or stranger. From a Nazi standpoint, there's no stranger, so to speak. I mean, there's, that, that is connected to me. And of course, the, uh, the root of the word love, ahava, is hav, which means to give. I'm summoned to give to the other and not appropriate the other. I'm known by what I give and not by what I conquer, in other words. I'm known by creating a space, a Lebensraum, and not appropriating a Lebensraum, so to speak. Now, this, this is, uh, I think, generally speaking, is a uh, sort of a general background to what I'll, I'm, I'm going to look at in more specific terms, in terms of the assault on the holy and the Holocaust, which manifests itself in the assault on the human. Um, metaphysically speaking, the, the assault on the holy 
shows itself in, in lots of different ways. In, in my view, it shows itself uh, from the start, from the beginning in uh, 1933 and the initial measures that the Nazi were take, Nazis were taking. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the Nazis are very careful to do everything in a legal manner. Uh, if you read the protocols of the Wannsee Conference from January 20th, 1942, you'll see that Heydrich is uh, insistent that everything be done in a legal manner. Everything done to the Jews was perfectly legal. So the first measures taken in 1933 you know, consisted of a, a series of, of legal actions taken. On April 7th, 1933, it became illegal for Jews to work in civil service, to work for the government. Uh, the second law passed on April 21st, 1933, was a law prohibiting ritual slaughter. By the way, there are European countries that also have such a law now. But why implement that? <laughs> If, you, if, if you're interested in you know, uh, legislating Jews out of society, why do you care where they buy their meat? Or how, they're, how, they're, how they kill their cows, right? Um, the this, this second point of legislation, it seems to me, goes toward a vertical dimension in the Jewish thinking about humanity and, and being a Jew in relation to neighbor and, uh, and God and all the rest of it. Uh, of course, under a, a Nazi conception of law, there's no such thing as an unjust law, which is also contrary to Jewish thinking and Jewish teaching. The Talmud says that any time a judge renders a verdict, he should be trembling because he's being judged, you see. Um, in the Nazi courtroom, the judge isn't trembling. The one, the Jew is trembling, you see. And uh, just a, a sort of a sideline, I would suggest that there is a direct relation between how we think of law and how we think of person. It's only if we can determine something sacred, something holy about the human being, can we determine anything like an unjust law. Um, of course, when the when the Nazis implement, began implementing their measures by degrees with the ghettos and, the, and, the, uh, and then later the final solution, um, they would plan their actions against the Jews according to the holy calendar. Um, there was a, a joke, if you can call it that, in the Warsaw Ghetto that if we can, live, if we can make it for 21 days, we'll be okay. The, the 21 days on the holy calendar. Um, it's often, if, you know, uh, indicated by survivors that we had no calendar in the camps, but we knew when the holy days were, because that's when the major selections would, would take place. The, the deportations from Warsaw, the first, you know, the major waves of defor deportations were initiated on the 9th of Av, which is the anniversary of the destruction of the temple. This is a new destruction of the temple. Um, needless to say, it was prohibited for Jews to observe the Sabbath and to observe holy days. Part of the protocol of the uh, Nazi army as they marched to the east uh, was what all armies do, what uh, the American army is trying to do, is to take seats of government, uh, you know, power centers, uh, military centers, uh, media centers, um, and, and to destroy Torah scrolls, synagogues, or desecrate Torah scrolls, synagogues, uh, holy books, anything they could find that might be held sacred to the Jews. If you saw Schindler's List, you saw Nazis cutting off side curls, uh, you saw the, you know, the rabbi in one scene with his beard, and the next scene, you maybe don't recognize him because he doesn't have his beard. It was illegal for Jews to have beards. And of course, having a beard is not just a quaint and curious custom. Having a beard is, is commanded in Torah and Talmud, and it's, uh, the Talmud says the beard is the glory of the face. The, the beard is a way of turning, saying to God, here is my face, <coughs> you see. Um, if you read the diaries, the diary of Heim Kaplan, uh, for example, he, he notes that the time when, uh, that, that came when prayer <coughs> was forbidden and regarded 
as an act of sedition. So this is not like uh, say your prayers because you're going to get it. It's we're going to murder you and we forbid you to pray before we do. Prayer is an act. What is an act of sedition? An act of sedition is anything that undermines the, authority, the authorities, you know, the authoritating, authoritative rule. Prayer itself threatens the Nazi authority. In fact, um, <coughs> Uh, in his book, Nazi Culture, uh, George Mosses uh, points out a, uh, a program for rewriting some of the prayers in Germany to include the Fuhrer instead of God in these prayers. Um, mikvahs were desecrated, destroyed, and uh, you know, forbidden to, for any, to any Jew to use. The mikvah, what is a mikvah? A mikvah is uh, a ritual bath, and it's used for purifying oneself for lots of different uh, occasions and reasons. Um, Hasidic men uh, use, it, use the mikveh every day to purify themselves for the work of the day. Uh, re many religious Jews, uh, when they awaken in the morning, will wash their hands to purify their hands for the work of the day. Um, one uh, major use of the mikveh has to do with laws, laws of family purity, which is family sanctity. Um, in other words, married women use the mikvah between menstrual cycles so that they can return to the conjugal relation, which is a holy relation. Why? Because it's about entering into the partnership with God to bring something holy into the world. Um, in, in this prohibition against the use of the mikvah, you have an, an, an implicit assault on, whole, on the holiness of the human being and the, and the marital relation, the, and what constitutes a family, what constitutes a home. Uh, Emanuel Ringelblum notes uh, the, uh, the time when uh, men of valor, as he called the Nazis, removed the, the mezuzahs from all the, the Jewish apartments. There is no, the mezuzah is a, is a little container on the doorpost to our homes containing scriptures that's, that indicates the sanctity of this realm. Um, there's, there is no realm that is sacred. There is no home, in other words. And every Jew, every Jew in Nazi Europe was homeless. A Jew could not live as a Jew anywhere under the Nazis, certainly after 1939. In other words, you couldn't have, this is where, uh, you know, Shlomo Goldenberg lives. The Jews were in hiding. Jews were in camps. Jews were on the run, Jews were in ghettos, but they had no home. Indeed, the ghetto itself is, is the antithesis of home. As Yehuda Bauer points out in uh, his history of the Holocaust, in the Warsaw Ghetto, there was an average of between seven and eight people per room in the ghetto. Um, the ghetto is an instrument of extermination. The ghetto is not a place to even hold Jews while you wait to have them deported. The ghetto is part of, part of the extermination project itself. Um, so I mean, anything connected with, with testimony to God's authority or to a higher relation was forbidden. Um, and of course, the, the, the Jews, by degrees, were legislated out of existence. Heim Kaplan notes in his diary that anything a Jew does to stay alive is illegal. Of course, this is in a ghetto where the, the legal amount of food allowable came to about 220, 225 calories a day. Um, What about the assault on the human then? If the assault on the teaching, tradition, observance is there. What about, the, what is, how do we then understand the assault on the human? Um, when Elie Wiesel in Night pulls into the, you know, into Birkenau and, and is uh, being unloaded from the train, you may recall, one of the prisoners unloading the train asks him, how old are you? 
well, I'm not, I'm not yet 15. No, 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 no. You're 18. You're 18. Remember that. 18, not 15, 18. Why? Because if the guy doing the selection even thinks that you're a child, looks at you as a child, you're going to go to the gas chamber. It's not, it isn't merely a matter of who can work, who can't work. It's nothing so pragmatic. Um, very often, very typically, children were taken first. Uh, you see this in Schindler's List, for example, when they come to take the children before they, they take the mothers and fathers. Uh, children are designated targets, they're first targets. Uh, if you read si uh, Simon Wiesenthal's book, The Sunflower, he recalls not having seen a Jewish child in two years. He recalls the time in the, in the Wolf Ghetto when uh, Katzmann, uh, the Nazi, decided uh, he would set up a daycare center for the Jews while they went to work. They can come, you know, leave their children. He says that though we were nervous about having all of our children in one place, it was not exactly, you know, optional. And they were, like any normal person, they were trying to think, well, it's a daycare center, right? Imagine, those of you who have had children, who part of your, tr your routine is going to pick up your children at the daycare center or at school. You go and there's nobody there. The Nazis created realms void of children in a very calculated manner. Now, what does this mean? What are the implications from the standpoint of the assault on the holy? What is the, uh, Elie Wiesel says it's as though they knew what children mean in our tradition. What do they mean exactly? What are the teachings concerning children? Um, first of all, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, in, in Jewish teaching and Judaism, there is no notion of inherited sin. Uh, a child is without sin. Children are not in need of redemption. Children are the source of redemption in Jewish thinking and Jewish teaching. Um, Children are the manifestation of holiness in the world. And any of you here who, who has children, anyone who has had a child, who has held your newborn in your hands, who was five seconds old, and looked into those eyes taking their first look at the world, knows that it's holiness looking right back at you. It's a moment of clarity in our lives that are otherwise often confused of what must be done. I have to care for this human being. Of course, we forget almost immediately. But tell any mother, well, the, this, this child you're holding is actually inherently sinful. It won't fly, certainly won't fly with a Jewish mother. Uh, and it doesn't fly with the Jewish tradition. So what is being removed is, first of all, purity itself, um, holiness itself. The, the, the Midrash says that when the Babylonians went into Jerusalem and took away the priests and the Levites, the holy city was nonetheless holy, that God's presence, the Shekhinah, continued to dwell in Jerusalem. But when they took the children, the holy city was no longer holy. The Shekhinah also went into exile. The Talmud tells us that the world is sustained by the breath of little children not by the shoulders of Atlas, but by the breath of a child. The world is sustained by holiness, by meaning, by mission in life. That's, and that comes to us through the children. We're also taught uh, that uh, it's only the prayers of children that reach God's ears, which makes it very important that we teach our children the prayers. Why? Because their lips are untainted by sin. Uh, and of course, prayer is not only a means of addressing God, it's a means of God addressing us. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Who is the you in the prayer? It's the one uttering the prayer. To get rid of the children is to render God deaf, in other words. It's to render God distant and remote. It's to make you start to doubt God when your children are gone. There you have an assault on the holy. And of course, um, 
The child is a vessel of time. The child is, uh, signifies meaning because the child signifies a future. I mean, who here who has children does not attach your sense of future to your children and, your, and what's going to become of your children? It takes you beyond the horizons of yourself, which is an illusion anyway. Suddenly the death that concerns me, my being toward death, is not my death. It's the death of my children that concerns me. And what parent doesn't, I mean, the, one of the, the, the horrors that, that, that will enter a parent's mind if you let it is that God forbid you won't die before your children, right? Um, so there's no future, there's no meaning, there's no holiness, there's no redemption in a realm that's made void of children. There's no history. If there's no future, there's no past either. The children are the ones to whom you transmit the past. Um, children, of course, come from somewhere. Uh, most directly, they come from a mother. And here you have the criminalization of motherhood. In other words, the assault not just on mothers, but the very notion of mother. Um, because the, it's not anything that the Jew has done that is the problem, it's that, that the Jew is. It's the being of the Jew, not the transgression of the Jew. As, and therefore, as Primo Levi points out, for the Jew, the lager, the concentration camp, is not a punishment. It's not a punishment. It's a being relegated to a status for the one whose being is, Ill, is criminal as such. Um, Jewish birth, therefore, is, in other words, is, a, is the crime. Being born, and, and uh, God forbid you should be pregnant because you, you, you become an accomplice to this crime. Uh, in November 1931, Emanuel Ringelblum notes uh, in his uh, notes from the Warsaw Ghetto that it was, and you see this in other diaries from the time, uh, the decree that came out that any Jewish woman who was pregnant must have an abortion. So you see, they had their abortion issue as well, a little different from ours. But anyone who is pregnant has to have an abortion. Uh, this, with this decree also came a pro prohibition against weddings and funerals, um, both of which I could you know, sp speak about you know, to, uh, at, at even more length. But let me just comment that the word uh, for marriage and the word for holy is the same word, kiddushin, the tractate and the Talmud that deals with marriage and weddings and marriage laws is kiddushin, means, which has the same root as kadosh, as holy. Um, in any case, motherhood here becomes a capital crime. And of course, you can see the, the horrific uh, implications of this and how it gets played out in you know, memoirs of, of that women have written of the camps. Uh, namely, when a woman is found to be pregnant in the camp, it's, it's the most catastrophic news she can tell her friend. Uh, if, you re if you've read uh, Sarah Nomber uh, Pschistik's book, uh, Auschwitz, True Tales from a Grotesque Land, there's a chapter in there called Esther's Firstborn. And Esther, who has lost her mother, finds that she's pregnant. Um, she arrived pregnant. I mean, that was, they don't get pregnant in the camp. They come in pregnant, and then they, you know, five months, six months, into it, they realize they're pregnant. Um, she tells uh, Sarah, her, the, the author of the, of the memoir, I'm pregnant. And, you, and this tells you about a distinction between world and anti-world. In the world, when your friend says, I'm pregnant, it's, it's, cause, it's a great uh, simcha, right? It's a great joy. It's a great it's a cause for celebration. It's a miracle. It's a blessing. Uh, Sarah Nomberg says, you know, she, Esther told me she's pregnant, then she says, I turn to stone. You, 
you can't have babies here. And these women are, are placed in the, in the impossible position of killing the newborns to save the mothers whom they love, who are their friends. Because if it's found out that any one of them has had a Jewish baby, both of them will be murdered for it. Both of them. Of course, Esther is still in, she's still thinking like a human being. Oh, but when Mengele sees my baby, he'll, he'll realize this baby is so beautiful, he'll never even think of killing my baby. And Sarah tries to tell her, no, no, you, we have, you, you can't have a live baby. And, she, and Esther can't understand it. I, uh, I, I want, but I don't want a dead baby, I want a live baby. And of course, Mingala sends both of them to the gas chamber. Um, I think this is a defining feature of the concentration era universe, certainly of the women's camp. Not just, you see, it's not just killing every Jew, mother and child, it's, it's making being a mother itself criminal. Now, uh, I, I, in, to my mind, uh, this, is a, this goes to a funda also a fundamental assault on the holy and holiness. If you read the, the, the text from uh, the traditions, the Talmud tells us that blessing comes to a home only through a woman in the home who is a wife and a mother. Uh, the home becomes a dwelling place only thanks to the presence of a mother in the home. You see, the, 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 the avenue of blessing it is, flows through the woman. The avenue of Torah flows through the woman. In uh, Exodus uh, chapter 19, verse three, it's written that the, the, the house of Jacob and the children of Israel were gathered at Mount Sinai. And of course, knowing that nothing is in Torah by accident, the rabbis ask, why does it say house of Jacob and children of Israel? And why is house of Jacob first and children of Israel second? Um, after some discussion, uh, one explanation is that the house of Jacob pertains to the women. And the children of Israel, the Bnei Yisrael, are the men. And the, and the women are mentioned first because it's only through women that we know blessing can come into the world. Therefore, it's only through women that Torah can come into the world. Women open up, mystically speaking, the gates, so to say, that, that allow Torah to flow into the world. Um, the first letter in the Torah, the bait, which is closed on three sides and open on one, and it, it is compared to a womb. Out of the womb of the bait, heaven and earth are born. Torah is born. Out of the, by analogy, out of the Jewish mother, sanctity comes into the world. That's what's being made illegal and prohibited. Uh, indeed, um, in the mystical tradition, the, uh, the creator is often referred to as the supernal mother. The assault on the mother is an assault on the creator. The, it's the, uh, and in the, uh, in the prayers, especially in uh, the uh, prayer books such as the Nusach Ari, the, uh, the Lubavitch uh, prayer book and other Hasidic prayer books, you'll find God being referred to by a feminine you and by a masculine you in various lines and various parts of the prayers. Um, God, we call it, refer to God as Harachamim, right? The compassionate one. The root of Rachamim is Rechem, which means womb. God is, Harachamim is the, is the supernal mother. That's what's being closed, that womb is being closed up in the assault on the mothers of Israel. Um, the Torah we're taught is given in love. Uh, in, in, with, with the love of a mother. Nobody loves you like your mama loves you. That's the love that's being erased in the assault on motherhood and mothers here. Um, our mothers are the first ones to utter our names. Our mother is, without the mothers of Israel, Israel has no, not only no being, but no sanctity, you see. Um, 
Of course, where there's a mother, there's a father. Uh, here too, you have a dimension, another, you know, another dimension of the assault on the holy. Um, and uh, this often takes the form of, the, of an assault on the word. I mean, archetypically speaking, symbolically speaking, the, the father is the transmitter of the word. Uh, I remember uh, hearing of a Jew who was asked, well, how do you know there's a God? He said, my father told me there's a God and my father would not lie to me. The father signifies truth, teaching, not that mothers can't do teaching or truth or anything, but I'm speaking in symbolic terms. Uh, the, the father transmits the, 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 the text and the law, the, the stories, the word, the father sees to it that word and meaning are connected. Um, the father sees to it that, that the difference between right and wrong is learned, or if he doesn't, it's his obligation to find a teacher who will teach this. Um, but in this time, children were old and old men were as helpless as children. There's the reversals of roles. If you, you'll notice in Night by Elie Wiesel, the reversal of the role between father and son. The son is like a father to the father, and the father at least twice is referred to as like a child. Um, here too, uh, you see the elders of Israel are targeted. Of course, with regard to the mothers, if any, if any woman arrived at, in, in Beer Canal with a child, both of them were, would go to the gas chamber immediately. Um, with regard to the elders, if one is perceived as, you know, an elder, so to speak, uh, if Elie Wiesel's father is uh, 50, he should tell the, anyone who asks that he's 40, right? You remember this also. Uh, this too has to do with, the, you know, the perception, are you one of the teachers, one of the uh, purveyors of the memory and so on? And, and not, perhaps not on the conscious level of the Nazi, you know, beating them or anything, but, um, there is a targeting of the teacher. Um, in Hebrew, the, mer the word more and hore have the same root. The word for teacher and the word for parent have the same root, for example. The fathers signify, uh, to put this another way, the memory. Um, both Elie Wiesel and Primo Levi uh, stated independently of each other that the Holocaust was a war against memory. Um, you may have, uh, you'd be familiar with the teaching from the Baal Shem Tov, uh, it's a famous teaching, the founder of Hasidism, that as, as oblivion or forgetfulness is tied to exile, so is memory tied to redemption. I mean, this too is an assault on, on uh, the Holy One, on redemption, on the presence of anything sacred in the world, uh, here manifest as a sacred teaching. But it's also, uh, you also see this in other ways, this assault on memory. Uh, if you saw the, uh, the film Schindler's List, you may remember the scene uh, where uh, Amon Goethe is giving his troops the pep talk before they liquidate the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, he says, you know, the Jews have been in Warsaw for 600 years. Uh, it's actually 800 years. Um, but he goes on to say, uh, by the end of the, this afternoon, those 600 years will be a rumor. They never happened. And he calls this an historical occasion. We're going to erase the memory that the Jews have and that people have of the Jews. Um, memory of what? I've suggested memory of teaching, memory of tradition. I think uh, fundamentally, it, as odd as this sounds, it's memory of one's own name. I saw an interview with a, uh, a, a survivor that was done it was filmed uh, just within a, a couple of months of the end of, of, the, of the war afterward, who began by saying, my name, when I can remember it, is. And he gave his name, and I, I remember being taken by this. What is it like for someone to say my name when I can remember it and not be kidding, you see? Um, there, there is uh, in, in the memoirs this, this idea, you, and, and very often you know, this advice, the memory of the advice of one inmate to the other who will say you're going to have to work hard to remember your name here. Of course, the name is eclipsed by a number, and this is always a key point without variation in the memoirs. After that, I became A5773. 
um, in order to get your soup, so-called, as Primo Levi points out, you have to recite your number. I am you know, this number in German. Um, the assault on the name is, is uh, something that's understandably traumatic, but what makes it an assault on the holy? From the standpoint of Jewish teaching, Jewish tradition. Um, this brings me to <clears throat> just a brief comment on a question I'm often asked by my students. Uh, wh what is a Jew anyway? What makes someone a Jew? Is it that you're born a Jew or that you choose to follow Judaism? as if everything that happens is either the result of an, of an accident of nature or personal will. Um, the religious answer, as you know, is that it's neither of these things. A Jew is a, a soul that God has created before you know, any being born uh, and created for a certain mission in the world that entails something to do with Judaism. Um, God creates the soul through the utterance of the, of the according to the mystics, to the other, through the utterance of the name of the soul. When parents uh, start arguing over what to name their children, uh, the, the mystics say this is actually the parents working their way into a prophetic insight into what God has already named the child. Um, so that we are created from our names and, and our, we, are, we are created from our names which come from Torah. We are made of Torah. We, are, uh, have, we have inscribed in our name a, a meaning, a mission, a testimony that we are to engage. When we, when we rise in the morning and say, Modeani Lifnecha, thank you God for you know, returning my soul to life, it's, the implication is, and for giving me my mission to perform today. <clears throat> um, the erasure of the name is the erasure of the divine imprint, the divine commandment to me, the, the, the divine essence, the, the divine likeness and image that that, that, that individual bears within him. Um, we're taught in the Jewish tradition that when we die, is a Hasidic teaching. <clears throat> and we lie in the grave, the, the angel of death comes to us to take us into God's presence, uh, into the presence of the Holy One. But uh, we have to be able to answer a question in order to be able to enter into the presence of the Holy One. And there's only one question, same question for everyone, but the answer is different, so I mean, it'll do you no good to look into the next grave to see what the answer might be. The question is, what is your name? But what do you know when you know your name? And if, you, if we can get to that, that you can see what's being erased in the erasure of the name. To know your name is to know the name of your mother and your father. I am the son or daughter of. It's to know what's been entrusted to your care in terms of teaching and tradition. It's to know how to answer when you're summoned to your task for, for which you are created. It's remembering what must be done. As, as uh, Emmanuel Levinas says, to know God is to know what must be done. To know what must be done is to know something about your name. The, the erasure of the name from memory is an erasure of any sense of mission, meaning, testimony from memory as well. <clears throat> now, just say a few words to conclude, and then we can uh, talk, if you like. Um, what is your name? When we come to this, and answering, here I am, to your name, uh, coming to this matter, we come back to the first things. We come back to metaphysics in a way. Metaphysics is about first things. Uh, the first question put to the first human being as, as the tale is told is, Ayeka, where are you? Where are you? Um, when the prophets and the patriarchs are summoned, Abraham, you know, Shmuel, 
they don't answer, huh, or what, they answer, hineni. Abraham answers, hineni, to God, to his son, and to the angel in chapter 22 of Genesis, in the story of the binding of Isaac. And hineni, here I, here I am, of course, in Hebrew, doesn't mean I'm right here in this spot. It means, hine, hine is, an, is a gesture of offering. Here I am for you. I am my answering of being there for you. That's who I am. That's what tells you I know my name. That's what tells you I am your neighbor, your friend, your brother, your, your father, your son. Of course, Auschwitz is a realm, as Elie Wiesel is told in Night, where there are no brothers, there are no sons, there are no fathers. Everyone here, as Primo Levi says, is ferociously alone because radically without holiness. The question, where, where are you, put to the first human being, is a variation on the questions put to his firstborn, to Cain. Two questions God asked Cain. Where is your brother? And what have you done? Not because God doesn't know. In case you thought he didn't know where Adam was, here it's clear, he, he knows where Cain's brother is and what Cain has done, for he says, the blood of your brother, the bloods of your brother have cried out to me. Cain has to say, in order to be Cain, where his brother is. And he says that with his hands, according to what he has done. He says that by answering Hineni, here I am, to his brother, not just with words, but with his hands, with his deeds. The Holocaust here in the assault on the holy is an assault on this capacity for answering, where is my brother and what have I done? It's a, uh, an assault on the capacity for answering Hineni, an assault on the whole notion of brother, the whole love for neighbor, the whole idea of relation or connection to my fellow human being, to the widow and the orphan and the stranger. And uh, one last word, in the light of all of this, an assault on holiness and uh, how horrific it is, how singular it is. Um, I find that when I teach courses on the Holocaust, from time to time, I have to have a talk with my students so that they won't get lost in this abyss, so that they won't despair, because it's very easy to get lost, it's very easy to despair, especially when there is this total eclipse of anything uh, meaningful, of anything holy in the world. Um, there's this terrible frustration over wanting to do something about it. I, I was once uh, speaking with Emil Fackenheim uh, at his home in Jerusalem, and, uh, or rather listening to him, and uh, he was discussing his engagement with the Holocaust, what he was working on, and as he was speaking, suddenly his sto he stopped, and his lips started trembling, and tears started running down his cheek. And he said, I just realized what I've been trying to do for the last 30 years. I've been trying to undo it. But I can't. I can't undo it. And I see that frustration in anyone, just about, who engages this topic. I can't undo it. What can I do? I can, I can say, Hineni, out of these ashes comes to us a question, where are you? I can, an I can if not undo it, or even do something about it, I can do something meaningful as a response to it. And these que the question comes from the ashes, not just metaphorically, in 1986, I believe it was, uh, there was a nuclear accident in Chernobyl. A, a, a cloud of radioactive material went into the air uh, and the atmosphere from, from a chimney in Chernobyl. Some of you may are old enough to remember that. Two weeks later, radiation levels in Montana were up. My uh, colleagues in earth sciences tell me, I have no reason to doubt them, that you can measure the levels of pollution 
year to year by taking a plug of snow and ice from Antarctica. Here we're talking about not one chimney and one cloud one day. We're talking about dozens of chimneys operating constantly for a thousand days. The ashes cover the earth. The ashes are in the earth from which we harvest our bread that we put into our mouths that become part of us. The question is, what will we make that bread into? Will we make it into merely outcry and despair, or can we transform it into an embrace and testimony and a, a deeper sense of the infinite responsibility we have to and for one another because each life is infinitely dear, and in that way return some sense of holiness to the world. Thank you. philosophy of, of, of the Nazis comes from, if you come tomorrow morning at 11, uh, I'll discuss this, comes from the philosophy of the Enlightenment, or at least a certain line of it, a certain line of thinking. I, I'm not saying the Enlightenment was evil, the Enlightenment is much more complicated than that, but uh, the Enlightenment is the beginning of a process of thinking God out of the picture, and the Jews stubbornly cling to what's, what philosophers are trying to think out of the picture. And that generates, that adds to the hatred. That's not, I mean, there's a lot more going on with the hatred than that, but I think that adds to it. Yes. In terms of what you said, not only against Jews, but that the whole Nazi thinking must have been to eliminate a lot of this spirituality, because I understand that Hitler youth were encouraged to turn their parents in for saying things at the time. And I understand that older Aryan youths were encouraged to mate to create more children, but not necessarily in a parenting situation. Yeah, yeah. Parents just to create more areas. You're referring to the Lebensborn program. Uh, it was a breeding program. Uh, you get some, uh, you know, nubile Aryan women together with Aryan SS men, and you make more Aryans. I mean, there too, you can see a change in the notion of mother, father, child, family, husband, wife, the whole thing. Yeah, no, it comes, it's, 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 it's a mirror that returns its reflection, sure. Um, the assault on the humanity of the Jew takes us, takes, robs the Nazi of his humanity. And if I may, I'll, uh, I'll relate one anecdote from the Warsaw Ghetto that I've read in at least three different sources, and uh, with slight variations. The Nazi is in the ghetto and is about to take a woman's children, two children from her. Of course, she's crying and begging and pleading, please don't take my children. And he says, uh, uh, I'll tell you what. If you can guess which of my eyes is an artificial eye, you can have one of your children. She says, the right eye. Didn't hesitate. Why, yes, how could you tell? She said, it looks more human than the other one. <laughs> you see. So, no, yes, ma'am. Two-part question that comes out of your remarks about attempts to undo this, uh, frustrated attempts to undo this. Do you know of any individual or group in today's society that that speaks of, of with this philosophy? I mean, with this Nazi, these Nazi concepts. Is there anything of that alive today? That's what I'm asking. Oh, Nazis are alive and well. With a whole, with that whole philosophy. They're in the Arab Muslim world predominantly. In May, May of 2001, there was a scholars conference held, a scholars conference, not a website of some, you know, Aryan nation in Ohio, Idaho. Scholars conference held in Amman, Jordan, May 2001, to demonstrate that the Holocaust didn't happen. Last April, 
one of the professors of Saudi Arabia, Arabia published in Al Jazeera, a newspaper in Saudi Arabia. I'm speaking like someone from UTD, one of your scholars, explaining that uh, Jews murder Arab children in this case and use their blood to make homentashen. It wasn't matzah in this article, it was uh, at Purim last year. Homentashen. So you have I mean, I could go on, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the interest, the, the, the exterminist, exterminist, er, exterminationist anti-Semitism is quite widespread. You don't think there's an exterminationist philosophy against any other groups in the world? Yeah, the short answer is no. Um, there are other groups in certain parts of the world who, for political or economic reasons, certain authorities would like to eliminate but they're not gonna to go to the North Pole and find every last one, you see. Um, in, whether it's Rwanda or Bosnia or the Khmer Rouge or, you know, the other, or Sudan or other places where horrific mass murder is taking place. There's not an interest in, in going to you know, the Arctic Circle to find the last one, and that's a, that's a difference. There's also, you also don't have the ontological and metaphysical interest, if I can use a couple of big words. It's, it's predominantly ethnic, or political, or economic, you know. Yes? Why did the Nazis go to obliterate the entire Jewish population and I know that other religions were included, but not to obliterate them. So what was the difference between, say, the Jews, the Catholics, the Episcopalians, or? The Jews, and only some of the Catholics or some of the Orthodox or whatever, whatever the other Christian denominations might be. Um, because the crime of the Jew was being alive, the crime of the Catholic priest was interfering with the Nazi project to kill the Jews, for example, or for, obje for hiding a Jew or objecting a Jew. A Christian had to do something to get himself thrown into a camp. A, a Jew didn't have to do anything, <laughs> right? Why? Um, I mean, why did it all start Jews and that? Well, that's, you have to uh, keep in mind a, a uh, a context of animosity toward the Jews that goes back at, you know, at, in Christendom to the, to the advent of Christianity. Um, the, you know, the, 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 the soil of hatred toward the Jews is, is, has been tilled and prepared for centuries already, <clears throat> and f religiously and theologically, uh, philosophically, uh, you have the anti an animosity toward the Jews with regard to the law and their insistence on following the commandment of God and not the self-legislated laws of your reason. So there, you know, there's this insistence on law, on commandment. Um, with the Christians, the, it's not that Christians can just do anything they want, but the emphasis is on faith, sola fide, right, by faith alone. Uh, that's much less dangerous. As long as the Christians are minding their own business, the Nazis can exploit their hatred of the Jews toward their own ends. Uh, you may want to speculate on uh, what the Nazis might have had in store for the Catholics had, once they finished with the Jews. And indeed, Catholics were, were concerned about it. And uh, in my opinion, the reason that the first diplomatic recognition the Nazis got was from the Vatican, was so that the Vatican could protect the Catholics in Nazi Germany, not certain of what their fate might be otherwise. When did Bonhoeffer, who said, you know, first he came for the mentally ill, who was that? The Nemo. 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 Yeah, Nemo. Nemo. First he came for the mentally ill, I wasn't mentally ill, so it didn't bother me, and then he came for the, the, the <laughs> Trade unionists and uh, you know the different levels. And finally, they came for know. me, and there wasn't anybody to speak out. Right. Uh, you didn't mention much about the Nazi view and their ideology between Jews and Bolsheviks. Uh, I question when they invaded the Soviet Union, um, how did they treat communist party members who worked 
ethnically or religiously Jewish? Do they consider, do they love them all as Jews or what? Um, it's a question concerning the connection between Jews and Bolsheviks. Uh, from a Nazi standpoint, you're quite right. There's this almost a syn synonymous relation between Jews and Bolsheviks. Um, how did they deal with Communist Party members? Communist Party members but we're Russian, yeah, or, and we're communists. yeah. That's, how did they deal with the, the non-Jewish communists? Yeah, did they treat them as Jews, or did they? They treated, the, the Nazis treated, uh, well, of course, any, any Jews that they could determine to be a Jew, they would exterminate. Uh, the other Bolsheviks, they treated with uh, incredible brutality. Um, much more, I mean, it was something that far exceeded the treatment of any other prisoners of war. In fact, they normally were not sent to prisoner of war camps. They were sent to concentration camps. Uh, they were left out in open fields and, and given a pile of lumber and some nails and told to build their own camp. You know, so, uh, and then, and they were, you know, the Russian prisoners were murdered and beaten and, but I mean, they, they weren't sent on trains in any organized manner, sent to gas chambers, but they were brutalized, they were murdered savagely by the Nazis. I'm not talking about the, the communist party apparatchiks, like the commissars or the... the well, the, they were shot. even though it seemed like their philosophy overrode the practicality and that they would exterminate Jews, even though, practically speaking, it didn't make sense. They would have made good slaves if nothing else. But yet, there were officials in the Nazi, uh, not maybe Nazi party, but like, uh, for instance, were told that there were sea captains, ship captains that were Jewish, that they left alone. Uh, do you have any comment on that? In the German Navy? Yeah. If that claim uh, got, you know, uh, the claim that some sea captain or officer in the German Navy, German Army is, is Jewish or has a Jewish grandmother, if that were to be established and go past the level of rumor, that individual would have a serious problem. Yeah, it wouldn't be left alone. Elie Wiesel, and as for your comment on it, Elie Wiesel, certainly when he speaks to Jewish audiences about the Holocaust, always brings up the, the, the claim that when the camps were liberated, almost every ethnic group took its revenge on the Nazis that were available, except for the Jews. And his claim is that the first thing that the Jews did was pray. Was pray. Yeah. I, I have no reason to doubt that that was what happened where he was and when, you know, that that's his memory. I, I don't think he's lying about what he recalls. Uh, but with regard to the matter of, of revenge and, uh, uh, and Jews who took revenge or didn't take revenge, um, in my reading of, of uh, many, many memoirs and uh, accounts and uh, from people who, soldiers who were in the American GIs who were in the camps, who, who would hand Jews their weapons and say, shoot anybody you want. Jews would refuse that. Um, there was very little that took place in the way of, re of taking revenge. Uh, remarkably little for people who have seen their children and their parents and their wives and husbands murdered before their eyes. Uh, I do, uh, having said that, uh, it's not as though no Jew ever killed anybody who, you know. I do, there are cases of, of the capo being hanged or the SS guy being shot, um, but th there's been remarkably little revenge called for or taken by Jews in the aftermath of this event. The chosen people feeds directly into anti-Semitism. Could you comment on the concept of the chosen people? Sure. What is, what is the notion of the chosen people? Um, it doesn't mean elect. Uh, as, I've, as your rabbis will point out to you, um, a, a Jew can go to hell as quickly as anybody else, even more quickly, 
because the Jews held to a higher standard, at least according to Jewish teaching, than, than others. Uh, chosen means chosen for an assignment. Um, a Jew is chosen to attest to the chosenness of every human being. A Jew is in the world to say that every life has meaning, every life has a mission, every life matters, every life is sacred. And indeed, when the Messiah comes, and this teaching is inscribed in the, into the hearts of every soul, of every person, and uh, the swords have been beaten into plowshares, the rabbis say there will be no more distinction between Jew and non-Jew, because the task for which we were chosen will have been accomplished. Uh, yeah, I'm having trouble getting my mind around this. Help me out. I, like many Jews today, get very distressed over the inability of us to accept and understand and honor each other, the different groups within Judaism, the tensions between. But it seems that the accomplishments of the Nazi was to wipe out distinctions and homogenize the entire, every Jew was the same. So am I looking at something I should stop fighting and say that our strength within Judaism is actually in our diversity and not in our homogeneity? Sure. Um, yes. Is our strength not in our diversity, and, and uh, our strength is in our diversity, and not in our being alike? You're not even within the uh, the uh, tradition of orthodoxy, or even Has Hasidus. You're not supposed to have homogene hom homogeneity. You're not supposed to study without a partner to argue with you and oppose you. Um, you're not supposed to have no questions. <laughs> in fact, I know of a case of a, of a young man studying to be for ordination who, uh, who was refused ordination because he had no questions. He knew everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, as for, I'm sure you're referring to other kinds of diversity within, among the Jewish people. Um, when we, could, we have to, you, well, you can't have dialogue without difference. And if you're going to talk to each other, you have to understand that you're different from one another. You have to listen to, listening is a much more important capability than speaking if you're a teacher or a student or someone engaged in any kind of exchange. Uh, and nothing is more painful to me than to see a Jew bashing a Jew like we don't have enough trouble, right? We have to cause ourselves more. Um, my personal, I, if I can, if you'll forgive me for sharing my personal view here. Um, one place, well, I just say what I like about where I daven, where I go to pray. What I like there is, is the love for the Jew and rejoicing in, in anything that a Jew does that is Jewish and not saying, why aren't you doing X, rather rejoicing that you're doing Y. Isn't it wonderful you have a mezuzah on your door? It's a wonderful thing. You know. I know you're eating your cheeseburger, but I love this mezuzah on your door. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's rejoicing in, in the connection that you, in the testimony, whatever the degree of it is, and embracing the human being who's there uh, doing it. I think that's much wiser than beating each other up. Uh, really, because the chosen people, why didn't God interfere? This reminds me, uh, if I can tap dance around this question. Uh, the most difficult lecture I ever gave on the Holocaust was to a, a class of third graders. And if you wonder, well, how could you talk about Holocaust to third graders? These were, it was in a Jewish school, and these kids had seen numbers on their grandparents' arms. So they, I mean, they know about it. And I just told a very brief story about uh, a child whose life went from normal to miserable, you know, in the ghetto, and I didn't go into much more than that. This little child raised his hand, nine, ten years old. I said, yes, Adam, I know him. Yes, Adam. Where was God? Why didn't God interfere if the Jews are the chosen? If God is God, why didn't he interfere? Um, from the stage, <laughs> what did you tell him? Um, 
our tradition insists on two things, um, at least. <laughs> I know 613, but there are two things that, that our teachers and our text insist upon. Number one, that we, we can't be silent when we think God has fallen silent. Uh, after God rebukes Job, he says, my servant Job has spoken rightly because God wants Job to object and speak up and say, where are you? There's no justice. Um, God is in that question, where is God? God is in that distress over God's absence. That's one thing that's, that's insisted. The second thing that's insisted upon is, uh, as it's taught in the Midrash, God says to us, when you are my witnesses, I am God. When you're not my witnesses, I'm not God. In other words, if I want to create an opening for God, I have to, rather than ask, where is God, I have to, do, to focus on my, my presence to my fellow human being. God enters through the doors open by the help that I give with my hands. So, uh, where was humanity? Is a, is a parallel question to where was God in this event. From a, the, the, no place is it written in Torah that God is all-powerful. God enters where, his, where the door is open. We, God needs our hands to open the doors. God wants us to object. The only place in Torah where God, you see God thinking to himself is when he's about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? I think I'll tell him. This is the first conversation they have after sealing the covenant. I think I'll tell him, so I, I want to know if he understands the nature of this relation, and Abraham argues with him. Will the God of the world, will the judge of the world, he says, be unjust? You can't do this. Wait a minute, you can't do it, you can't do it. It's, it's a similar line of argument, line of questioning. Moses argues with God several times. Um, the reason Noah had not attained the level of righteousness that would, that would draw a covenant and Torah into the world was that he didn't argue. He just said, okay, I'll build the ark, I'll build the ark. Um, so I, mean, I love this, I mean, don't, don't ever let go of this question, why didn't God interfere? Where is God? We have to put this question to God, but I think God is in the question the El is in the She'elah, the Hebrew word for question, She'elah, has in the middle of it El, which means God. God is in that question, in that challenge. We have to wrestle with God. After all, that's what Yisrael means, right? One who wrestles with God. Um, the last thing that should happen is that we forget about God or ignore God, because if we do that, we will forget about and ignore our neighbor as well. We'll forget that our neighbor matters, that our neighbor is a child of God. We'll forget that God has asked me to do something. Um, I love uh, the account of you know, the trial of God in the camps, uh, at least one account, that God has put on trial for not interfering. And uh, just as God is about to be found guilty, is found guilty, uh, they say, okay, it's time for Mincha, let's all pray. I think that's what must be done. Of course, praying is not done until you've done something for your neighbor in, in Judaism. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you.